Jewish Space Pagers, probably my favorite tweet from what may be one of the most impressive military tactics used in my entire lifetime. We're going to discuss the updates with uh, Israel's interaction with Hezbollah, how they're actually hamstringing Hezbollah. We're going to discuss how that can become a nice litmus test for whether or not the influencer you are listening to is a critical thinker or an ideological thinker. After that, we're going to see why the new Matt Walsh film is actually essential to rebuilding a Western worldview. Then we're going to talk about what lessons conservatives can learn from the P. Diddy arrest. And finally, you've probably asked the question, if God is good, why would he allow so much suffering? We're going to look at the Stoic philosopher Seneca. We're going to look at his response to that very question. That and much more today on the Unsafe Media Podcast. Reporting by Ryan Saavedra over at the Daily Wire. Thousands of Hezbollah terrorists were injured on Tuesday during one of the most efficient large-scale large military attacks in the history of warfare. Israel reportedly infiltrated Hezbollah's supply chain and put a little bit of explosive material right next to the batteries so that they could be triggered remotely. They all went off at 3.30 p.m. yesterday and uh, approximately 4,000 people were injured, 500 of whom were in critical condition, and 11 were killed. At least 10 of the 11 were Hezbollah terrorists. To follow up on that, Israel detonates thousands of Hezbollah walkie-talkies today in a secondary strike. Uh, Israel blew up thousands of personal radios, walkie-talkies, which were used by Hezbollah members in Lebanon in a second wave of its intelligence operation. The personal radios that were booby-trapped in advance by Israeli intelligence services and then delivered to Hezbollah were a part of the militia's emergency communication systems, which were supposed to be used during a war with Israel, the sources said. Now here's what's beautiful about this attack, if it was successful, the coming weeks will determine if it was, is that all of these were incredibly small explosions aimed at only targeting and har harming those who would actively be fighting Israel. How do you attack terrorists who intentionally embed themselves among civilians? I mean, you could have a thousand different sharpshooters all aligned in different sneaky places. Well, you can't exactly sneak a thousand different snipers into a populated civilian center. But what if you could get uh, a very tiny bomb that would literally hamstring somebody delivered to each individual terrorist. Well, that's pretty brilliant. Now, here's where this becomes a really nice litmus test because Israel has divided both the right and the left. On the right, you've got your pro-Zionists and on the left, you also have some pro-Zionists. On the right, you have your anti-Israelis and on the left, you have your kind of Marxist activists who are also anti-Israeli. Now, unfortunately, Israel has become kind of a shibboleth in this divide where you either repeat the talking points that I want to hear and therefore you're a part of my side or you don't and I'm against you. And very little critical thinking is happening on all sides of this. So here's how this, this specific two, uh, at least two part uh, series of attacks, maybe there'll be more, um, can become a really nice litmus test for those that you listen to. If you're listening to Ben Shapiro or Candace Owens, you pretty much know exactly where they're going to line up on this attack. Now, we don't have very much information. It's hours since these attacks. More will come in uh, in the coming weeks. Here's the question you have to ask yourself. In the coming weeks, as we find out who actually was harmed by these attacks, if it turns out that this was, as it is seemingly purported to be, one of the most highly precise attacks in an urban context that we've ever seen in world history, meaning almost exclusively injured and killed terrorists and had little to no casualties on the civilian front, then no matter if you're on the far right or far left, if you're on the far pro-Israel side or anti-Israel side, you should be able to give them credit for that. If on the other hand, if it turns out that Israel did their best, but they blew it and literally, and they ended up killing a bunch of civilians, maiming a bunch of children, and not actually effectively targeting um, their uh, uh, terroristic counterparts, then they should be not only criticized, but any attack like this in the future should be condemned. Now, if, if you're being rational, how could you disagree with either of those two Satans? If it's one way, it should be credited. If it's the other, it should be condemned. And, and no further attacks like that should be allowed. If the person that you're listening to cannot entertain the possibility of credit or criticism, then their ideology, their worldview has been infected by a strain of anti-intellectualism. And if that's you, you have to purge it from your worldview starting today.
Now, let's move on to Matt Walsh and Am I Racist? Listen, you cannot go see this movie if you can't withstand the most awkward episodes of The Office. If you're the kind of Office fan who skips over um, Dinner Party or Scott's Tots, don't go see it. You'll have a panic attack in the theater guaranteed. If you enjoy those episodes, you will love this movie. This movie is so important because the culture war itself is always a battle for the normies, right? It's really to convince a critical mass of thinkers that a certain idea is either serious or contemptible. And then what that does is it, it creates a sort of framework in which normal people um, will consider ideas as viable options, okay? For example, we could solve a lot of our problems by nuking other countries. It would also cause a whole lot of problems. And because it's such a terrible idea, it should never be considered a live option, okay? Now, because of that, it's okay to criticize and ridicule the idea of nuking your enemies. Nobody seriously posits that idea because it's totally outside the realm of live options. A healthy society takes serious ideas seriously and it mocks contemptible ideas. Suffice it to say, we don't live in a healthy society. So it's important for our media to help shape our mindset and reshape our mindset towards taking serious ideas seriously and mocking these foolish ones. What this movie does a great job of doing is helping the average person see exactly what it is that the, D that the DEI and CRT grifters are positing by not strawmaning them, but rather platforming them. They paid, and they tell you exactly how much they paid. They paid thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to get people to show up on camera and be interviewed where they share their own ideas and then Matt Walsh basically just kind of smirks at the camera like Jim from The Office, right? Oh, you really think that? He doesn't present their ideas for them. He lets them do it. And then we get to laugh along with him. This is the kind of thing that shapes the normal perspective against these more radical ideas that have been mainstreamed. Now, have they been mainstreamed? Because our media for decades has been pushing these sorts of ideas at the subconscious level. Let me give you one example. This most recent, um, or the, not most recent, but this up and coming uh, TV show on Disney Plus, Agatha All Along. Uh, it turns out that it's going to be pushing a major gay agenda, but it's actually deeper than that because the gay agenda already won. It's now pushing a Marxist agenda. Why do I say that? Let me get into it for, with you. So uh, the, the stars of the show say it will be a gay explosion by the end of the show, okay, which is totally appropriate for uh, a superhero TV show. But it goes beyond that. So Sashir so Zamata, she says that she agrees the show is the gayest in the MCU. Um, she says it's the gayest project all along. Um, but then she says this, she says, witches are queer inherently just because we are outcasts at the, uh, uh, sorry, and set aside for many reasons. Now, if you didn't catch that, what she's saying here, you know, the show is super gay and gay totally fits with it because it's all about a show about witches and supernatural power and, and whatever else, superpowers. But she's saying that witches were always queer. Now, she's not saying that they're gay, that they're all lesbians, though I, I think that they're going to feature a lot of gay uh, lesbian witches. What she's saying here, and she says it right here, is they're always cast aside. Now, if you don't know anything about queer theory, I have a whole video on it. Uh, queer theory is one of the species of the sort of Marxist offshoots that simply recasts the, bour the bourgeoisie as the normal and the proletariat as the queer. And so the, the queer theorists criticize the gay rights movement as being too normative. They, they call it homonormative, right? The idea is that you're just replacing heteronormativity with homonormativity. And rather, there's still all these other people out there. And by the way, queer theory explicitly defends the most heinous sex crimes imaginable. Again, go to the video if you're curious about it. But what they're saying is, is, is that there isn't supposed to be a normal. There should be no normal, right? See, we always pushed witches aside because they're a dark and, and malevolent force to society. Witchcraft has never been about like love and peace and generosity. It's rather trying to harness elemental forces for your own selfish bidding, which is inherently evil. And yet the idea is like, oh, well, because they were cast aside, that it, it, by definition means they are the good guys. They're the proletariat. They're the, the virtuous outcasts. When actually some things are cast out because it's bad right? Normal is good. And we want the normal to be good. If the normal is bad, then we should reshift normal back towards what is good. We should not obliterate the idea of normalcy altogether. So in the same way, instead of 
pushing, say, queer theory, as Agatha all along is going to, this movie is pushing the idea that we should treat people as individuals. We should treat them with love and humility. We should aim at uh, not division, but we should aim at fraternity. And every idea that does the opposite of that should be scorned and should not be considered as a live option. And therefore, this movie is a fantastic thing to take your teens to. 13 is probably a little bit too young for the vast majority of 13-year-olds, probably 15 to 16 for the majority of uh, teens, but you know your kid best. Um, he will be interacting with these ideas. She will have to deal with DEI at her first job or second job. And so creating, helping shape the worldview in a way that goes, these are silly ideas that should not be considered is really, really important. I will put one little um, just uh, warning out there. There is a very explicit uh, reference to oral copulation that will not go over anybody's head. It is very cut and dry. And, and it's when uh, he's doing a kind of a man on the street type of interview. So just a heads up, uh, be warned. All right, with that being said, let's move on to some rapid responses. As most of you, I'm sure, are aware, Sean P. Diddy Combs has been arrested uh, for some of the worst things you can possibly be arrested for. Here are the sort of highlights. He was arrested for this kind of trafficking and for transportation for these kinds of purposes. And uh, let's see, he pleaded not guilty, but he was denied bail, which is um, surprising everybody, including his lawyers. Um, it's all tied to what were called freak offs, which were coerced acts um, that he allegedly orchestrated and recorded. All right. So what is the takeaway for the, the conservative? It is not this. Sean Combs equals 204 arrested when he was two, uh, 20,000 and 40 days old. And uh, synced with uh, 12,000, something blah, blah. If you just connect some of these dots, you'll find a lot of twos and zeros and fours. And apparently that's supposed to be some really important thing. Okay, th this is not it, guys. This is not the lesson. Wild, weird, tangential connections somehow related to numbers that has nothing to do with this case. Here's what conservatives do need to know. We turned against the Me Too movement almost immediately because it was weaponized in many ways. But here's a spoiler alert, guys. We're the justice people, and justice is giving people what they deserve. Let's assume for a second that Diddy, after the trial is concluded, that he's found guilty. We should rejoice. We want people to be punished for evil. Me Too brought about, or was at least connected to, Epstein. That's good. It was connected to Weinstein. That's good. It's connected here to, to Diddy. That's all good stuff. Uh, in the church world, we've seen many predators taken down. That's all good. Now, we have seen some incredibly high profile cases where these were not true, where it was lies or it was uh, intentional deceit or manipulation or exaggeration. All right. So I'm not saying that we should hashtag believe all women. But we don't want to be the party, the, the movement that throws out the baby with the bathwater. We have to separate the wheat from the tares, gents. OK, we have to be able to say that those who prey on women and children should be put away and suffer the most severe forms of punishment the society can dole out, while at the same time, they should be tried in a court of law and they should be presumed innocent until proven guilty. You can hold both of those at the exact same time without any sort of cognitive dissonance. And I encourage you, I implore you, conservative Christians, to do exactly that. Let's say your pastor is accused of, of one of these things. Don't immediately assume there's no way it could possibly be true. Presume innocence, but look for evidence presume innocence, but look for evidence. Because a lot of times these things, in fact, do go unreported. We know that the feminist um, stats, like one in three, it got inflated for a while. There was one in four. Now they're saying one in three. We know that that's not true. Okay. But that doesn't mean that it's not underreported. Most of us know people, women that have been um, betrayed, abused, that have not reported it. All right. It is underreported for many different reasons, many psychological, some sociological, some built directly into the system. And we can listen to and hear those kinds of criticisms because as conservatives, we care the most about protecting women and children, or we should. And so because of that, when we see stories like Diddy's, if it turns out he's guilty, we should all rejoice. We should not eschew the Me Too movement just because it has some excesses. We should note and condemn the excesses while embracing any kind of mo movement that leads to the punishment of actual criminals. Moving on from Diddy to the media, as Andrew Clavin points out, the media 
always highlights whenever a conservative or Republican does something bad. And the story is simply Republican did bad thing. And then whenever a Democrat does something bad, it's always Republicans pounce about this thing. This is from The Hill, one of the most respected outlets in the nation. GOP seethes after second attempt, uh, apparent, sorry, assassination attempt on Trump. I love how they use unrestrained language when it comes to the GOP, but they use incredibly restrained language whenever it comes to the assassination attempt. Well, it's apparent. It just looks that way. We're not really sure yet. And yet one of the very first paragraphs admits that uh, authorities have confirmed, yes, it was in fact another assassination attempt. So why downplay it? Uh, it's pretty obvious. They have a radical agenda. Now let's see, are, are they seething? Is the GOP seething? Number one, would it be appropriate to seethe after the second assassination attempt of Trump? Yeah. Are they? No. In fact, they do a pretty darn good job. Let's see. Uh, Tommy Tuberville, one of Trump's most ardent backers, says they're going to eventually get the guy killed. Why does he say that? You hate to say it. But what it looks like is an intentional act of what? And are they trying to get him killed? He says an act of not funding what they should fund to help him. I hope nothing happens. Does that sound like he, like seething? Criticizing their, their resource allocation? Hmm. He says the Republican nominee has already been shot once. Wake up. We're leaking oil here. First off, that's a great turn of phrase. We're leaking oil. Does that sound like seething? Or does it sound like a measured but serious critique of the Secret Service so far? It's like, what's going on here? And is anyone safe? Says Senator Josh Hawley. He says, this is ridiculous. The guy has another assassination attempt and we're still slow walking the one from two months ago. Josh Hawley continued speaking about uh, the information that we still don't really have about the first assassination attempt in which uh, Trump was shot in the face, right? I don't know. Is your ear on your face? Is it just your head? He was shot in the head. The takeaway here is if they can do this with the attempted murder, the second <laughs> attempted murder of a politician who is already shot in the head, then I don't think that there's a level to which they won't stoop. I don't think that there's any story that could, ha that, 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 that could be going on in the nation that they won't try to manipulate you. And th this, is, this is so important to understand if you're a normie, you have got to not only listen to conservative sources, you got to listen to multiple sources because there's really almost no way to get at the truth anymore unless you're, you're looking for the common facts shared by both the right and the left. The, the, the environment is too poisoned. And if you're a lover of truth, then you've got to quit being this sort of ah, red headline kind of a guy. You have to move past that. All right, moving on to Trump being a dictator. I feel like... Um, uh, what is it? End wokeness. Uh, this is probably one of the best tweets I've ever seen from that account. He says, I assume he says, uh, path to an American dictatorship. Step one, empower the bureaucracy. Now, what, why is that so important? Why are we always on about the bureaucracy? It's unaccountable. It, 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 it's millions of people working for the government that are neither elected nor directly overseen by elected officials. And therefore, it's almost impossible um, to face to, to push back against the sort of tide that is the bureaucracy. So empower those who are totally unaccountable. Number two, censor speech or dissent. Well, we've seen that 100%, not only through Twitter, but Zuckerberg just the other day says this. Zuckerberg says Biden administration pressured Meta to censor COVID-19 content. This is from Reuters. That is as clear a violation of the First Amendment as you can possibly get. You not only can the government not censor you, but it can't pressure private companies to censor you. They're the ones who are against your ability to speak openly your criticism of the current regime. Step number three, disarm the population. Listen, I'm not a, a personal fanboy of Trump. I, I don't just love the guy. I wouldn't let him babysit my kids. But he's not about empowering the bureaucracy. If anything, he has stripped them of so much of the power by cutting through regulation. He has done nothing to censor dissent. Though he criticizes the media, he's done nothing to actually censor them. And finally, he's the only side that is not trying to take away your arms. The only candidate running against this agenda is called a threat to democracy. Note, not only is that true, but he also is the only one to have been shot and he's the only one to have been subject to entirely illegitimate lawfare. I get your trepidation around Trump. You don't have nearly enough trepidation about the Biden-Harris administration. I get why you feel threatened by Trump's presence. You should feel more threatened, more threatened 
by the Biden-Harris administration. That's enough for that. Let's move on to our last segment, Wisdom and Virtue. I picked up On Providence by Seneca, and I was shocked by the opening line because I did not think that this would be the purpose of the book. He says, you have asked me, Lucilus, I don't know if that's how to say his name. Uh, you have asked me, why, if the world be ruled by providence, so many evils befall good men? Well, we've all asked that question from time to time. I think that Seneca has a real keen insight here. He immediately says that we have to know that both God exists, is with us, and that governs, and that he is one governing the world, right? That's the, the idea of providence. So he's saying you're almost glossing over the foundation of this question um, by asking that question. So you're asking me to, to deal with the, the consequences of a whole series of facts that we have yet to prove. So he says, I'll deal with it, but, but just realize we're assuming that. And then he actually, he decides, uh, I love the way he words it. He says, now it would be superfluous to prove God's existence. And then he goes on and spends about three paragraphs proving God's existence. And he presents uh, an argument from God from design. He says, objects whose motion is regulated by chance often fall into confusion and soon stumble. Things that are governed by chance don't orchestrate themselves in uh, in maybe a fancy way to say it is like a low entropy system, a system that is has very, very low levels of chaos and very high levels of order. That's not the way random motion works. Rather, random motion produces chaos. And so whenever you see a system that is highly ordered, this should indicate to you that it is in fact not ruled by chance, but ruled by something like a governing mind. He says, but the world itself, like the assemblage and the movement of the stars, showers of rain and clouds, the rush of lightning, quakings and the tremblings of the earth, huge growths that produce from minute seeds, warm springs amidst the waves of the sea, the retreat of the sea itself, and everything else produced on the earth. They do not depend on accidental impulses, nor do they come to pass without reason, but rather the regularity and the proportion of such causes and effects prove that the universe is, quote, governed by and is, quote, in obedience to some hidden law. He calls it, in fact, some sort of eternal law. By seeing the world as it truly is governed by laws, this proves beyond a shadow of a doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the world isn't ruled by reason. And if the world is ruled by reason, well, that means it's ruled by a mind. Reason isn't produced by accidental forces. And therefore, for him, it's a foregone conclusion. I think it's important for us, for it to be a foregone conclusion. God exists. He is not one of those ideas that should be... Now, we should seek to understand the intellectual justification for God's existence. But if we're constantly having to rehash whether or not he exists, then we're never able to move on to the more weighty and serious consequences like why would bad things happen or hard things happen to good people. Seneca begins, that we'll go through this whole book, but here in chapter one, he has three major points. And the first is this, and it's relatively savage. He says, you do not doubt the existence of providence, but rather you complain of it. Okay, so it's not that you're doubting God's existence per se. You just don't like what he's doing. That's hard because all of us have complaints about the way our lives have gone. All of us have things that we don't like about our lives and our circumstances. And he's saying, this question is really not a doubt so much as it is a complaint. Here, I would like to say, say law, pause and meditate on that. Literally, feel free to pause the video and ask yourself, is that is that the place my heart is at? I, obviously, there is intellectual doubt there. I want the question answered, but am I asking it out of intellectual curiosity or am I asking it out of sadness and bitterness? And it's okay if you're asking out of sadness and bitterness, but be aware of it because it, here, here's the reason why I said some people will, will criticize you. It's really common in the, the charismatic world. Like, oh, well, you have a root of bitterness and they use this to discount what you're saying. You could have a root of bitterness. The only reason why I want you to know, know that is so that it does not skew the intellectual answer, okay? If you're bitter, you may not be open intellectually to the answer to your question. That doesn't mean that you actually have to deal with this before dealing with this. I, I don't know if that's true. I'm not a psychologist. But I do know in my life, whenever I've been a motivated thinker, just being aware of my motivations has really helped me in more carefully analyzing the questions that I want to get to the bottom of. So are you complaining or are you asking? And if you're asking, then let's deal with it. Now, he doesn't actually go into the rigorous intellectual or philosophical defense about, you know, God has reasons. There's no contradiction between good God and evil outcomes. Um, there's no 
uh, probabilistic problem, but he does get to, I think, a good satisfying emotional answer to the problem of evil. So if you're looking for a defense of the logic of it, uh, let me make another video on that on another point. In fact, I actually think I have scrolled through some of my videos. Um, what, oh yeah, yeah, here it is. It's Ben Shapiro on the problem of evil. Go check that one out. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you'll find that one on my page uh, where we deal a little more intellectually with it. But on the, intel on the emotional level, why? Seriously, God, why? And he says this. He says, I will, on that account, more readily reconcile you to the gods who are most excellent to excellent men. He uses gods and God interchangeably here. He does seem to be a bit of a kind of a classic monotheist in that there are many small gods, but one most high. And that, that's the one he refers to in the, you know, uh, singular. Whereas there are these little gods that maybe are, are related to the higher God that then do some of his bidding in the ordering of the world. But with that being said, his, his quasi polytheism, poly uh, quasi monotheism aside, uh, he says they're most excellent to men who are most excellent. And I think if we're honest, we see this. First, think about it. Am I complaining or am I asking? Second point, the more moral virtue I cultivate, the greater I see God to be. Usually the most virtuous people you know are the ones who are also the most convinced of God's goodness. That's a generality, but it's true. And then third, that's actually the reason for the harsh dealing. I want to read to you a longer portion of his writing here. Bear with me as, much, as best you can. He says, between good men and the gods, there is a friendship which is brought about by virtue. Friendship, do I say nay? Rather, relationship and likeness. Since the good man differs from, from a god in time alone, meaning he's not eternal, being his pupil and rival and true offspring, whom his glorious parent trains more severely than other men. So the idea is a, a good man is a man that has been trained by God, insisting sternly on virtuous conduct, just as strict fathers do. When therefore you see men who are good and acceptable to the gods, toiling, sweating, painfully struggling upwards, while bad men run riot and are steeped in pleasures, reflect that modesty pleases us in our sons and forwardness in our houseborn slave boys that the former are held in check by a somewhat stern rule, whereas the boldness in the latter is encouraged. Be thou sure that God acts in like manner. He does not pet the good man. He tries him, hardens him, and fits him for himself. Why does God allow these hard things? Why does he allow you to painfully struggle? Because the painful struggle produces in you moral excellence, and moral excellence is what God wants in his own possessions. The Bible is incredibly clear that Christ died for us to be his inheritance. We are likened to his bride. We are his prize. We are the thing for which he suffered. And therefore, he is purifying us through what we suffer. And if you think about it, every good thing you want in life is directly connected to your moral character. I want to be the best father. Moral character. I want to have a thriving business. Discipline. Work. Effort. That's my moral character. I want to be a fantastic husband moral character. And so by producing in us toughness, valor, virtue, sternness, stoicism, by producing those things in us, God is enhancing our joy and helping us see his goodness and ultimately leading to a life abundant. Rejoice in sufferings, James says, or as Paul puts it, and I really like the way Paul puts it, he says, we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has, given, who, uh, who has been given to us. So we turn to God. He tries us, hardens us, and fits us for himself. And all of that produces in us eudaimonia, the greatest happiness imaginable. With that thought, I'm going to leave you there. Consider joining the Patreon linked down below. And until next time, I'm reminding you, trust in God and keep your powder dry.